How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Welcome to Climate One, a conversation about America's energy, economy, and environment. To understand any of them, you have to understand them all. I'm Greg Dalton. Today we're debating the Keystone XL and other pipelines planned to deliver oil from the Canadian tar sands to refineries in Texas. The pipeline has become a symbol of the fierce debate over how to create jobs and meet energy needs without wrecking the climate that supports life on Earth. Supporters say Keystone and other pipelines will boost America's economy and help replace oil from unfriendly nations. Opponents say building pipelines for some of the dirtiest fuels on Earth commits the United States to a fossil-fueled future and will accelerate severe weather. The Obama administration appears poised to approve the pipeline and is expected to issue a final decision soon. Over the next hour, we'll discuss Keystone and broader issues around oil markets and climate disruption. Joining our live audience at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco, we're pleased to have with us two people on each side of this debate. Greg Croft is a lecturer in the Earth and Environmental Sciences Department at St. Mary's College of California. He's also a veteran of the oil industry. Cassie Doyle is Consul General in San Francisco for Canada and former Deputy Minister for Natural Resources. On the other side, Sam Avery is author of A Pipeline in the Paradigm, a new book about Keystone XL, and Dan Miller, Managing Director of the Rota Group, a venture capital investment firm uh, with investments in biofuels. We should also note, for disclosure, Dan is a contributor to Climate One. Please welcome them all to Climate One. Uh, welcome. Cassie Doyle, let's begin with each of you, with you and all of you uh, to ask a little bit about how you came to the issue of the oil industry, in particular the oil sands uh, in, in your career. So welcome. Okay, thanks. Thanks. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here and to be part of this conversation. Um, I came to this issue really not with the oil industry, but I, I've, I'm a longtime public servant. I worked for the Department of um, Environment in Canada and Natural Resources Canada's deputy minister. I also was an old uh, environmental regulator for the government of British Columbia. So I come from a, through a public service background. Sam Avery, you were a solar installer, and how did you come to write a book about a pipeline? Well, my interest in this pipeline really stems more from my opposition to mountaintop removal in my own home state of Kentucky, uh, which also is the reason why I'm a, a solar installer there. But I, was, I am very passionately moved by the disturbance and the destruction of the earth itself in order to extract fossil fuels anywhere. And when I realized the extent and the size of this particular deposit in Canada, I was absolutely horrified especially because of the dynamic of the climate. There is enough carbon in this tar sand deposit in Western Canada to send the Earth's climate into an irreversible tailspin that would make life itself questionable in the coming generations for plants, animals, and people. That's enough motivating factor for me. And we'll, we'll get into all of those. Uh, Dan Miller, as an investor, how did you get involved in the uh, oil debates and climate debates as a, I think you're a climate evangelist. Well, we've been doing venture capital for a long time, um, from the, the, the 90s and um, in internet and things like that. And then I started reading about climate change in the 90s and in the early 2000s, uh, started working with Chabot Space and Science Center. I'm on the board there to do climate programs, started meeting and talking with climate scientists. And I be became uh, aware that this is both one of the biggest risks we ever face, but also addressing it is one of the biggest economic opportunities. And then we switched our firm to investing solely in clean tech from about 2005 uh, to, to now. Okay, great. Greg Croft, you're a veteran of the oil industry. Uh, tell us how you came particularly to uh, oil sands and, and, and related issues. Okay, yeah, the, uh, my involvement with the oil industry goes much further back than my involvement with the oil sands. I uh, went to work in the oil industry since I finished my master's degree back in 1983. Uh, worked a number of years in a number of different countries, but never worked on the oil sands. Then uh, back in 2006, I decided to go back and get a doctorate degree, qualify myself for teaching college level at UC Berkeley. 
and I ended up getting in some discussions with people there, actually in the nuclear engineering department. They were looking at the issue of using nuclear power to generate steam for production of this heavy oil in the oil sands area. So I ended up giving some talks on the oil sands at Berkeley. One thing sort of led to another, and I got to be kind of a regular speaker of it with, on the subject at uh, both the Canadian Studies Group at Berkeley and various other uh, usually professional association type meetings here in the Bay Area. Okay, so let's talk about the issues here that, that we're going to talk about the pipeline as well as the oil sands that, that would go into it. Uh, Cassie Doyle, lay out for us the case why Keystone uh, Pipeline in particular is good for America and good for Canada. Well, I don't want to overestimate the Keystone Pipeline, but the overall energy relationship between Canada and the U.S. is one that uh, delivers economic benefits to both countries as well as um, as uh, I'm just thinking economic benefits as well as energy supply and energy security. So I mean, we have Canada and the U.S. enjoy the largest binational trading relationship in the world. We have highly integrated economies. Uh, we over the last like 15 years, Canada has become the largest supplier of energy to the United States. And that has, has prosperity benefits for both countries. So in terms of the government of Canada's position, we see that, there's, that it makes the most sense to have this uh, North American integrated like energy system as opposed to some of the alternatives. So that's kind of the highest level in, in terms of the benefits. And you're saying that it's better to get oil from Canada than from Venezuela or other Middle East countries that may be uh, less friendly toward the United States. Yeah. Buy from your friends rather than your enemies, right? Yeah, buy from your friends and also buy from a country that has the identical climate change commitment that was signed in Copenhagen, the same climate change objectives and goal as the United States. So we have, we have a highly aligned regulatory system on areas like vehicle efficiency. So we do have, I think, the same aspirations. So it's not only are we friends, but we have comparable environmental regulatory systems, and that differentiates Canada from any other supplier of oil to the United States. Sam Avery, uh, let's hear your thought on Canada as a friendly oil supplier. Isn't it better to buy from our neighbors than our enemies? Yes, it is. And I would not refute any of the economic reasons for this pipeline or any of the economic reasons to extract and to burn tar sands. It will produce jobs, a few. It will produce tremendous new investment opportunities. And it will produce hundreds of thousands of new barrels of oil into the world economy. I don't, I don't dispute that. But this is much bigger than an economic problem. We're talking about the living system of the earth that we all live on. And if we build this pipeline for economic reasons, it will be because our understanding of the natural world that we are all living in is limited by what I call the economic paradigm. The economic paradigm assumes that economic growth is the primary purpose of human society. And it treats consumer demand as a given. You'll notice that a lot of the reasons for the pipeline are that if we're going to get burn oil, we might as well get it from a friendly country. If we're going to ship tar sands, we might as well ship it efficiently by a pipeline rather than a railway. These are true. But if we limit our understanding to the economics, we're going to lose sight of the real problems and the real trouble we're going to get ourselves into if we blindly follow our appetite rather than our intelligence about what we're going to do. Dan Miller, you're an investor. You look at the economics. I'd like to hear your thought on the, on the economics of the oil sands development in oil and also the alternatives. If we don't burn oil, what are we going to use to run our economy? Well, oil sands are, I guess, one of the most expensive unconventional fuels that are out there right now because it costs so much to squeeze oil out of the tar sands and, then, and, and move it. But uh, there are alternatives today. Some are technology uh, alternatives, like biofuels, which actually are, are 3%, I think, of the U.S. Uh, uh, fuel is biofuel today. It's not the best stuff. It's ethanol. But there's a lot of really good stuff on, on the horizon using cellulosic uh, um, materials, which means they won't use food materials. They use waste products from plants. 
That's just a few years away. It's already, uh, you know, demonstrations already. So those, those alternatives. But there are much, much simpler alternatives. Uh, everyone knows that uh, climate change is a huge problem. Uh, the World Bank, the International Energy Agency, Price Waterhouse Coopers, not exactly all liberal groups, say we're headed to a four degree world. Uh, on the path we're on. That's Celsius. So That's Celsius, that seven degrees Fahrenheit, I should say. I should try to do it all in, in, in Fahrenheit. And uh, uh, Kevin Anderson, who's a climate scientist at the uh, Tyndall Center in the UK, says about a seven degree Fahrenheit world that it's incompatible with an organized global community. Think about what that means. Is beyond adaption, so you're not going to just turn up the air conditioner, will be devastating to the majority of ecosystems and probably is not stable, which means it will lead to even higher temperatures. So that's just absolutely unacceptable. And so burning, uh, so we need to find alternatives. A simple thing is to price the, the external cost of fossil fuels by putting a price on carbon. That alone, in, in some of the models of, of, of carbon prices that would give all the money back to the public, that would reduce oil consumption by six times the amount of the Keystone pipeline. So there, that would stimulate the economy, drive investment and innovation. So there, there's technology solutions, there's policy solutions that can solve this problem, and we just need to sort of have the, you know, we have to do it. We have to actually get there. We're going to get Greg Croft in here in a minute, but first, Cassie Doyle, do you, uh, your response to the notion that burning the tar sands is going to create huge climate consequences? the carbon intensity of this massive carbon deposit in, in Alberta, in Canada, that burning that is going to make climate change worse. Well, you know, when you look at this paradigm that Sam was mentioning between the economy and one that is much more, you know, responsive to the environment, I think what's intervening in that is regulation, policy, and technology. And, and I think that when we, it, it's how that uh, oil is extracted and how it actually is brought to market. And one thing that often gets neglected in this discussion is that the environmental performance of that extraction continues to improve. And it's, it improves because there are uh, uh, governments, both the govern government of Alberta and the federal government in Canada, that have increasingly stringent environmental regulation. So we need to understand what we're talking about. That Canada has the third largest reserves of oil in the world, after Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. So when, if we isolate and, and focus only on the oil sands, I think it's a bigger question around all the fossil fuel in the world, because we're number three. But we do have, of, of those top three countries, the strictest environmental regime that will continue to produce oil in a way that drives down climate change, uh, their GHG emissions and, and input such as, as water and overall energy. So I, I think you've got to look at the overall picture and not just, I don't know whether it makes sense just to isolate one reserve in the world because if, if, if Canada does not provide oil to the U.S., Venezuela will be there, Saudi Arabia will be there. So it's certainly, it, it's not as if we somehow can solve the, the real challenges of climate change in mm -hmm. this world by turning off the supply from Canada because that oil, there's going to be oil coming into the U.S. Because, from, from because, some source. because we demand it. Uh, and the State Department, uh, which approved the Keystone uh, Pipeline initially, said that the, the tar sands oil is 17% uh, more dirtier than, than conventional oil. Let's get Greg Croft in here on, on that. Mm -hmm. But it's about, you know, it, it is, a, and that's the magnitude of uh, the comparison of the oil sands versus conventional oil. Yeah, that's about right. The, there have been a number of studies published. The numbers I've seen range from 12% to 17%. Those numbers, though, are based on the entire emissions from the initial production of the oil, converting it into fuel, and burning that fuel on the end. Some claims of much larger differences have been made by just separating the production process. But I would argue that this full cycle where you're getting the 12, 17 percent difference is the better way to look at it, because burning the oil is what we always do with it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and Dan Miller, but, but that's I mean, heavy oil to heavy oil. Is, there's a well, well, those other ones we're talking about just production. We're talking about heavy oil to burning the uh, gasoline right. at the end is mm -hmm. 12 to 17 percent more than our weighted average barrel that's consumed in the U.S. and how it's produced and how it's refined, mm -hmm. which gets to be a whole complicated subject in itself because we're trying to do a weighted average of everything we use. But, but we can do it simply yeah, because, no, yeah. because uh, 
it's true that uh, oil sands or tar sands oil is, is less efficient. It takes more energy to get it out. But ignoring that, the amount of carbon in the, the tar sands is about 230 gigatons. And to give that, put that in perspective, the National Research Council said that mankind can burn 1,000 gigatons in total to have a 50-50 chance of staying below 2 degrees Celsius, 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit, the number that all governments, Canada government, U.S. government, all governments agree we better not go over, and there's really good reasons not to go over that number. And uh, so that leaves, we've already burned 500, uh, roughly. That leaves 500 to go. The tar sands are 230. And there's enough of conventional coal and all those other things that we actually have to leave most of that in the ground to have a chance of, of, of avoiding catastrophe, really. And so there's, I know it's a very complicated subject, but we need to immediately and dramatically lower fossil fuel emissions. And it's very hard to do that while you're actually increasing them. So somewhere we have to stop increasing them and actually go down, and the tar, tar sands are a great place to start. So, but isn't it, Cassie Doyle made a point earlier that basically we're picking on Canada, that it, it's part of a, of a whole system. Uh, there's Venezuela, there's Saudi Arabia, and ultimately it's all of us who drive around in our cars and fly on planes. We are the problem because we are the demand, Sam Avery. Right, and this is a very important point. We really shouldn't be picking on poor Canada, and we, we apologize. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't be picking on the poor Keystone Pipeline either because these are just symbols of the overall problem. According to the Carbon Tracker Initiative, there is now in proven reserves around the planet three to five times as much fossil fuel available as we need to raise, that, than we would need to raise the climate two degrees centigrade that, that Dan was talking about here. Which is the dangerous level right. that, that all the world has agreed to. Okay. Right, so the, the world has, has been able to do nothing about carbon emissions, but at least it has agreed that we have to keep climate change within two degrees centigrade. And we have five times as much fuel as we need to do that, right at our fingertips, proven reserves. So what this means is, we used to think years ago that we were going to run out of fossil fuel. We we're going to run out just about the time that we really need to get off of for climate reasons. But that's not going to happen. We're not going to run out. And instead of investing in renewable energy, carbon fuel companies have invested in new techniques and new deposits of extracting more and more fossil fuel, like fracking, like oil shales in North Dakota, and like the tar sands in Canada. So it means that the economy is not going to solve this problem for us. It's not going to price fossil fuel out of the market. We are going to have to decide where, when, and how we're going to stop burning this fuel and use something that we can live with and that we can build a future on. Cassie Doyle, Canada's actually done some of that, and particularly British Columbia has put a price, a tax on carbon. Uh, it didn't ruin the economy. Uh, British Columbia, is, in many ways, is a, a, a very vibrant place for clean technology. Uh, so it's, Canada's going, doing some really dirty things in one part of the country, but some very clean and green things in other parts of the country. Tell us about British Columbia. Well, British Columbia, actually both Western provinces, British Columbia and Alberta, both have put a price on carbon. In, in British Columbia, it's a revenue, revenue neutral carbon tax, and that has been quite successful. It's been in place now, I think it's up to about five years, and is, is, is widely accepted. In, but business screamed and, and said, it's, you know, the, the sky's going to fall, but it correct. actually turned out okay. It turned out okay, and it actually hasn't had any, it, in, if anything, it's actually um, been I instrumental in seeing a clean tech industry grow mm -hmm. in British Columbia. So it's actually been quite positive. In Alberta, um, Alberta was the first jurisdiction in North America to put, to bring in a regulation to drive down the carbon intensity of oil and gas production. And there has been a, about a 26% improvement um, it, between 1990 and 2000, and, or 19, somewhere in, in the last 20 years. That continues to improve. For those companies that cannot achieve the, the required reduction, they pay into a fund at about $15 a ton now, which is one of the highest carbon prices in the world. And that fund is dedicated to technology investments 
to reduce the overall carbon footprint of the oil sands. So there has been, both at the provincial level, we have feed-in tariffs in Ontario. Quebec has just um, signed on to the cap-and-trade program with, um, with the government of California. So there is, there is a fair amount of activity um, happening in Canada. And at the national level, we are also, we, we have brought a regulation in to put an end to all coal-fired electricity that is done in the traditional method. And we have a very clean electricity system in Canada, which is actually uh, makes us unique. About 63% of our electricity is, is produced by renewable because we have this um, abundance of hydroelectricity in Canada, as well as a very active wind and solar industry mm. that the government has supported. So a lot of things happening, but there, it just seems that there's so much money in the oil, oil sands and investment that that money is going to be extracted and it's going to find a market and it's a huge economic driver. It's hard to resist. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing is that it's one of the major concentrations of oil production that is, that's in an open market economy. So when you look at the top three producers, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, and Canada, Canada is distinct in terms of having a very open liberal econ economy. Um, and so the invest, it attracts investments from all around the world into the oil sands where it's not possible in other countries that hold major reserves because it's more sovereign funds and their own countries that are investing in countries such as Venezuela. And as you look at, a, at an international regime where there's a price on carbon and countries are held accountable for the, their carbon, Canada is basically exporting its carbon, right? So it's, it's, gonna, it's burned somewhere else. So, so we're, we're burning here in the United States, and Canada's like, well, hey, we sold it, but you smoked it, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Just a, quick, a very Sam quick Avery? point. A quick point on that is that Canada has improved its efficiency for the extraction of tar sands and, and is continuing to improve the efficiency of the energy intensity of extracting tar sands out of the ground. But the real carbon impact is when it's burned elsewhere. And that's mm. still about 80% of the total carbon impact. That's and I think one thing people don't really Family. fully understand mm -hmm. is that um, climate change is, is unlike all other, uh, and certainly environmental problems, but general problems that we face. Like water pollution, if there's a lake and it's dirty and you finally get around to cleaning it up, it eventually gets clean again and you can use it. The, the, the CO2 that we're burning today stays in the atmosphere for hundreds to thousands of years. And so the, the, the short-term economic benefit, which is very real, that we're going to uh, enjoy right now is going to be a burden on generations for millennia. And, it, and that's something that makes it hard to think about. But that's why it's so urgent to make steps right away. The longer we wait, it's not like, well, we'll get around to it and fix it later. It's only going to get worse and worse and worse and when we finally fix it, we're going to have to deal with how long we waited to fix it. And that's why we have to act now. What would it take for the markets to address this? Because it's kind of hard to think about environmentalists really stopping something so big and powerful. But at some point, the oil sands becomes economic when price drops, oil prices drop below a certain point, at which point uh, it's just too expensive to get at the oil sands. And so I'd like to ask Cassie and Dan mm -hmm. where that point is and if that's, are there scenarios at which the oil price could drop to a point where those people in Alberta are saying, well, we just can't get this stuff out of the ground because it, it costs too much. Dan Miller? Well, yeah, a, a price on car, it's the most expensive oil to get right now. I, I, there may be mm -hmm. some Arctic things that are a little more expensive, but, but uh, it's, so when, as a price on carbon kicks in and it starts to grow over time, the, the tar sands will be the first thing that will be knocked off the list. And therefore, actually, that's another good reason not to build the pipeline, because you can waste a lot of money. There's no question 10 years from now, everyone will be very aware of climate change and will demand action. And this thing is supposed to last for 40, 50 years, this system, and we'll have to dismantle it then anyway. So it's a good thing to kind of save some money and not, not build it in the first place. Cassie, do I, at what point does the... <laughs> but one thing is that there is off. thousands of miles of pipeline that traverse our two countries. Already. So, mm -hmm. Already, that are in place now. Mm -hmm. And there's also kind of workarounds now, without a pipeline, then oil is come, being transported by rail and can go into Oklahoma and then pick up this big intensive network of pipelines in Oklahoma down to the Gulf Coast. So the one pipeline project, whether it's built or not, I don't think has any material difference mm -hmm. on the future of climate change. When you're saying that, that the majority of we're exporting emissions, every country that produces oil is exporting emissions. Canada in no way is unique in that respect. And the US can source its oil from all over the world. And in fact, the keystone, the heavy oil that we're talking about that's coming out of the oil sands, 
is, it, and the State De Department report clearly identifies that it is required to maintain the refineries on the Gulf Coast that were built special purpose to, to refine heavy oil. And that that would replace Venezuelan oil and some of the declining reserves coming out o heavy oil out of Mexico and California. So there's already heavy, oil, heavy crude being refined in the Gulf Coast. And this, this oil coming in from, from whether it comes by pipeline or it comes by rail, because this industry will find a way to work around, as all you know, industries will. And as long as there's a demand, they're going to be feeding that demand. Greg Croft, you've been waiting to get in here. Yeah, I, I wanted to make a point on that issue about if we raise a certain carbon price, which fuel will drop off at which point? Because I think you'll find, both from a desirability from an environmental standpoint, and the first thing that would drop off if you had, you know, if you could somehow produce a carbon tax and apply it uniformly over the whole world, the first fuel you're going to drive out is coal. Yeah. And the reason for that is it, it is it is used for a less valuable application, which is generating electric power. Oil is mostly used as transportation fuels. And you can see, look at how people complain, say, in the summer of 2008 when we had our all-time record gasoline prices here. They still drove, they still consumed it. In fact, they consume more of it than they're consuming right now. And so you're actually, if you bring up carbon prices till you start backing out of fuel, the first fuel you're going to back out is coal. But if you look at the argument that, say, if there's less pipeline capacity, you're not going to produce the heavy oil in Canada just on the basis of Keystone XL, if you look at what's happened in the U.S. when we have reduced the amount of coal we burn for power in the U.S., in, in the eastern U.S. in favor of natural gas, that surplus coal has been exported to China. So the coal is still being produced. That change from a coal-fired power plant to a gas-fired power plant, the power plant operator is saying, look how much I've reduced my carbon emissions, but the carbon problem is global, and we haven't solved any problem on a global basis because that coal is just going somewhere else and being burned. Dan Miller, let's have your response to that, and also Cassie Doyle's point that stopping the pipe, Keystone Pipeline will achieve nothing. Yeah, by the way, I, 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 when I meant when I said it's going to knock it off, I, would, I thought we we're talking about transportation fuel, so okay. that's, what I, that's what I meant. You're right, coal is, is for electricity, but it's not used, uh, hopefully not for transportation fuels. It's very bad if you convert coals to li liquids. Um, so the pipeline is, uh, first of all, it, it's uh, about rail transport. I mean, it's been shown in studies, and, and actually the TransCanada itself said, we need the pipeline in order to increase, um, increase our output because a rail costs too much, right? Because it, it's already starting as a costly way to get it out of the ground. You add rail, which is like twice as expensive as the pipeline, it, it makes it not as economic and therefore there won't be as much taken out. And, and also the pipeline itself, some people argue that it's a, a relatively small amount of this 230 gigatons that are in the tar sands. And that's true, but it's still enough to power, I think, all the cars and trucks in, in Canada. So it's not a small amount of, of, of uh, oil. And yes, you can argue we're going to get it somewhere else, but those, the conventional oils are drying up, which is one reason we're going to what's called unconventional oils, like tar sands. Mm -hmm. But we have enough of the conventional oils to, with uh, Sam was saying, to, to bring us over the, the danger limit. And we're headed there really quickly, by the way. And so going to unconventional oils, this really should just be totally unacceptable. We have to make a decision sometime. It's already mm -hmm. too late, probably, to at least avoid, well, we already, it is already too late to avoid climate impacts. We're seeing them today. Mm -hmm. But to really keep going down that path uh, from, from now on, knowing what we know, is, uh, is probably really a moral issue more than an economic issue. So Cassie Doyle, what's the path to, to mm -hmm. avoid those kind of impacts? You see countries doing different things, some dirty, some clean. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see as the, as the path to avoid the dangers that both uh, Dan and Sam have laid out today? Well. I see it from the perspective of how you set higher efficiency and environmental standards in the overall energy system. Be because when, if Dan, you say it doesn't matter if we get it from somewhere else, I would argue it does matter where it comes from. And this campaign on Keystone has been directly focused on Canada, and yet California produces heavy crude oil that has a higher carbon intensity than Canada. So I just saying that, and Venezuela is right now a major supplier to the U.S. of heavy crude oil with an equal carbon intensity to Canada. But what I see as a pathway is to um, address demand, which the, um, the, the, this president um, mm -hmm. administration is doing, and Canada is aligned in a movement to try to increase by, by I think, 50 percent the efficiency of our, our one of our major um, 
major components or contributors to GHG emissions is transportation. So to clean mm -hmm. that fleet is really important. Canada and the U.S. are aligned. We're the only two countries that are working on those very efficient um, light duty and heavy duty fleet standards. I think it's really important all in, in terms of the efficiency as well as increasingly stringent, stringency in terms of the safety of pipelines. So the Keystone mm -hmm. Pipeline would have 57 additional conditions that will make it the safest pipeline that's ever been built. So the continuously trying to improve the overall environmental performance as we move towards who knows what the future is. These pipelines and these investments are all private investments. So they're being made on the basis of an open market, as I'm saying. And mm -hmm. as, you're, as an investor, Dan, you know that they're looking at what the actual demand and market is going to be. But impacting and having an influence on how energy is used, I think, is really important. So we could keep using fossil fuels. It sounds a little bit like saying we can keep smoking, but we should put filters on the cigarettes. Right? <laughs> and somehow we'll make it less bad, and it'll be OK, and we'll die more slowly rather than die faster. Sam Avery? Well, it, to continue that analogy, it's like saying, well, this particular cigarette isn't going to kill me, so I might as well burn it. Or, right. you know, if, if I don't smoke it, somebody else will. So I might as well smoke it. I mean, you can get the mind forms all kinds of rationalizations for mm -hmm. consuming things. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is that this deposit in, Canyon, in Canada is measured in the in the trillions of barrels sure. of tar sand. It's, it's enough to do the job. There's enough <laughs> carbon in that deposit alone that we have to be careful about, we have to decide consciously whether we're going to follow our appetite or whether we're going to follow our intelligence about making the decision, do we tap into this new enormous source of carbon or do we invest our money in renewable sources. And a lot of people have invested in renewable sources, including Dan Miller, and you have to admit that biofuels have been disappointing. We've had lots of people here who said biofuels are going to do great things. You can drop them in, put them in your car, existing refineries, and they, Dan Miller, they haven't delivered on some of their hype and promises. Well, there's a general thing in technology field in general that people overestimate the impact in the short run and underestimate the impact in the long run. That certainly applies to this field as well. Everybody wanted it next Tuesday. It takes a little while. There's people working on these enzymes for cellulosic uh, uh, use of, of, of plant material that have taken a few more years than they thought. But actually, uh, even Solozyme has, has run a 500,000 liter tank of, of, of oil development. Uh, it was the largest ever, I believe. And they're building new plants and things like that. There's other companies that are actually coming online soon. It's been a year or two longer than they thought, but that's not. A, that's still a drop in the bucket compared to. And uh, Solozyme is focusing more on cosmetics and oils, things are, that are uh, low volume, high margin, uh, where they can make more money. Well, right now, but yeah, but, but uh, the stuff. Uh, but uh, actually, the the problem. Actually, one of the problems is that fuel is the cheapest thing you can make. It it's about the same price as bottled water. When you think about it, it's like three dollars a gallon, right? Go in the store and buy a bottle, big gallon of uh, water. <laughs> so, so, and there are other oils that are more expensive, but still, by the way, harm the environment quite a bit, like palm oil and things like that. So, so they're going to focus on the ones that can have the biggest economic impact in the short run as they build up capacity and as these other companies build up capacity. So that is an alternative, but there are other alternatives, by the way. Electric cars, it, really people shouldn't be driving personal transportation uh, with, with gasoline. I mean, an electric car is better than a, a gasoline power car in every way except for range and price, and those two things are getting better quickly. A few years, everyone will be looking back and going, why were we doing this? It's not true for airplanes, trucks, and, 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 and heavy equipment. We're still going to need liquid transportation fuels, which have very high energy density. And that's when, by improving the efficiency of those, we can still burn the oil that we have, but not find new ones and scale it down as we scale up the other. It's not that tomorrow biofuels are going to replace fuel, uh, uh, fossil fuel. But over time, we have to have a plan for moving downward. As they say, you know, so we have a climate problem. It's a big problem. As you can say we're in a hole. And as they say, the first rule of getting out of a hole is to stop digging. So the, so the Keystone Pipeline is more than just a, a, a pipe of fossil fuels coming into our country. It is a symbol, too. We, ha we have to make the change sometime. We should have done it 
20 years ago, but mm -hmm. if we don't do it like in the next, according to Jim Hansen on this stage, said we have three years left to begin reducing fossil fuel emissions globally or we won't have a stable climate for our children. Three years left. So if we don't start now, when are we gonna do it? Uh, Sam Avery, it's not happening fast enough. It's not. Um, and I think we can do it much more rapidly. Um, something Dan was talking about made me think, I'm a solar installer. And an example of an alternative form of energy is a, so, a single solar panel, 250 watt solar panel, will produce about 1,500 miles of driving per year for 30 to 50 years. One solar panel, 1,500 miles of driving every year for 30 to 50 years. Put 14 of them on your roof and you've got 21,000 miles of driving a year. Now that'll cost you $12,000 to, to $15,000. And it's all up front. You've got to pay that all up front. But if you do that, you will be driving for, at most, 2.2 cents per mile for 600,000 to a million miles. <laughs> and this is about eight and a half times less than you're spending for gasoline right now. So over the lifetime of the solar panels, you will save $100,000 and more and you won't need a tar sands pipeline. Greg Croft, you're a lifelong oil man. Do you see prospect in uh, electric vehicles or biofuels? I think, <clears throat> I think electric vehicles are actually what it's going to eventually be, say, 100 years down the road, because as we gradually <laughs> consume more and more fossil fuels, uh, the cost gets to be an issue, availability gets to be an issue. If you look at world oil production, it's been pretty flat since about 2005. And what's happened actually is consumption has declined in the United States as places like China and India have increased their production. Mm -hmm. So if we're going to count on continuing to have our entire transportation system driven by liquid fossil fuels, which is essentially the way it works now, you're, you're sort of making a cap and saying for some countries to come up, others have to come down. And that's going to be a big challenge. But when you look at the volumes of energy we consume now, that's a cautionary note on biofuels. Just America's oil energy consumption exceeds the energy content of all the food produced in the world for everybody. Mm -hmm. And if you look at, you know, a lot of promises have been made about cellulosic biofuels. A reasonable proxy for cellulose production in California is the historical timber production. California's timber production reached its historical peak in 1955 and has declined hugely since then. California's oil production didn't, de didn't peak until 1985. And so these so-called renewable resources, if they're extracted at several times the rate at which they renew themselves, end up acting just like non-renewable resources. That the problem, and I think this is actually coming around with all the panelists, whichever side of this we're on, gets back to the volume of consumption. As long as we're, and, and that consumption, when it comes to fossil fuels, is what drives the total carbon emissions. And as long as the whole world consumes more and more of this, the carbon emissions are going to increase. I want to talk about another pipeline, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. It seems like there's all different ways that this uh, oil from Canada is going to try to get to a market, get to ocean where it can get the world price. Some of that's through the east, some of that's through the south. Uh, there's a pipeline uh, that the San Francisco Chronicle David Baker wrote about recently uh, many people hadn't heard about that actually could bring some of this oil to, to California. So Cassie Doyle, tell us about the plans to expand that. The people in British Columbia, not so happy about it, but there are plans to get another pipeline to the west. Uh, from the oil sands and some of that would come by ship into California. Right, and, and in fact right now California does receive oil coming out of Canada. Two or three percent of California. S uh, California oil. oil is coming from Canada and it, it's increasing as the oil from the north slopes of Alaska is, is declining. That's a, a, a law, old, you know, a well established pipeline called the Trans Mountain. It comes out of northern Alberta through, through British Columbia and its terminal is in Burnaby, which is just outside of Vancouver. And that there are plans, that's run by Kinder Morgan, there are plans to, to expand the capacity of that pipeline. That's what's under review now. That pipeline has been um, running, I think it's 25, 30, 30 years or so, so it's pretty well established. There are also other plans to bring a pipeline through the a northern corridor, up through the no northern British Columbia, that would be essentially for Asian markets.
though there's an election in British Columbia next month, and the leading candidate for premier of, uh, of British Columbia, Adrian Dix, has been quite stridently opposed to that. So it seems like there's be some, this, these are political issues in Canada as well as in the United States, <laughs> and it looks like the people who are more opposed to uh, the, that pipeline might get in power in British Columbia. That, that, that's, quite, that's quite true, and there certainly is no end of politics around climate change in both of our countries, I'd say. <laughs> uh, well, it's one reason that the Canada wants to build these pipelines is, especially to Asian markets and, and the Keystone to get to the Gulf, is that uh, there's sort of a glut of Canadian oil in the, in the mid part of our country and, and it's like, a, I think it's a $20 discount to the global price of oil. So they don't like getting the discounted price, they want the, the world price. And so actually a lot of people say that the Keystone pipeline will actually raise the price of oil in the United States by I think four billion a year is what I read. Uh, because then once it's down to the Gulf, then if we don't pay the full price, then it could be exported to different countries at, at the global price. So there's another thing to, I mean, so there, it's always been argued that it's a great thing for the United States. I mean, I know we're taking advantage. And by the way, I should say, if you think Canada, and Cassie actually especially, does a great job <laughs> of promoting clean energy. I'm, as a clean tech investor, uh, I, uh, we have a, uh, an investment actually in Canada, a clean tech company. And, and they're doing, it, it's, I think it's actually a better way to go for Canada, to keep building up the clean tech part of the business than to, keep uh, um, working on the, the tar sands and exploiting that, although the, the dollars up there are very, very big. Sam Avery, you wrote a book about the path of the Keystone Pipeline. Tell us about some of the people you met, including uh, Randy Thompson, very colorful character in Nebraska, who says water is clean or dirty, it's not red or blue. Tell us about uh, it. Uh, Randy Thompson is the face of Bold Nebraska, which is a group which is adamantly opposing the Keystone XL in Nebraska. And as I drove the, drove, notice I used a car, <laughs> and, and that's part of the whole demand situation, and I take responsibility for that. But I met Randy and, and many people all the way from, uh, from Alberta, where the tar sands are, all the way down to Texas. Randy is a typical rancher in Nebraska in many ways. The pipeline is, scheduled to cross his land, and he objects to it originally not for any sort of climate reasons, but because it went across his land, and because it's not, this is not traditional crude oil. It's sold as, or it's, it's being marketed as another form of crude oil, but it's not. It's tar sand. It's, it's we call it oil sand. You can tell which side of the issue people are on, whether they call it oil sand or tar sand, but it's black. It's gooey, it's sticky, it's solid at room temperature, it quacks and it's a duck. But, <laughs> but at any rate, that's the reason why a lot of people are opposed to the pipeline along the route. Because if this pipeline breaks, and I, I know it's the safest pipeline ever built, but or, or the pipelines, <laughs> there's never been a pipeline that doesn't <laughs> break. And I was told that by a pipeline builder. So. They are concerned that their ranches, their farms, that they have invested their entire lives in, are taking an enormous risk of being ruined for miles around. And he's, his farm is actually near the Ogallala Aquifer, which I'm sure you've heard about before. When I was there in Nebraska last summer, it was an enormous drought, an enormous hot weather spell was climate change in action. And the surface waters had dried up. The Platte River was gone. No water at all in it. Everybody who survived the drought last summer tapped into the Ogallala Aquifer to irrigate their crops. It's that valuable to them. That, that is a life source for people in Nebraska and other Great Plains states. They're very protective of it, and this is the issue for them. But can I Cassie just to add, you know, that the Ogallala reserve is crisscrossed by hundreds of miles of old pipeline now. Not this tar sands pipeline. Well, and, and really the, the science now, and we're, has not proven that there's any noticeable difference between the two when it comes to the impact of spills. There is now an increase in the amount of oil being transported by rail. And the, there is, there's projections that it could be up to half a million um, 
uh, barrels per day going out by rail that will be crossing across a lot of farmland uh, over both countries mm -hmm. that has that has a higher incidence of, of safety issues. That's a risk with, too, with, there's no risk, doubt. Yeah. They're uh, both one, risky. One note, uh, there was a, a well-noted case in Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, where in 2012 the U.S. federal government fined Enbridge, a Canadian pipeline company, almost four million dollars for a spill that occurred there that closed uh, 35 miles of the Kalamazoo River for about two years after spilling a million gallons. Uh, Greg Croft, there are some differences between dill bit, the, the, the tar that comes through the pipeline, and conventional oil. We've seen that spill recently in Arkansas. So tell us the difference between uh, tar sands. It, some people say it sinks in water. Uh, it's, it's a different kind of animal than regular crude oil. Yeah, there's actually, when we talk about, we have conventional crude oil is produced pump through a pipeline, you separate the oil from the natural gas. Once you've removed the gas phase, you pump it through a pipeline. And that works pretty simply. What you have to do with a tar sands oil, because of the viscosity of it, when it's produced, it will not go through a pipeline unless it's hot. So what you do is you either put in a diluent to reduce the viscosity. What they use is naphtha. Naphtha is the very lightest product of a refinery. It's lighter than gasoline. And they mix this with this really heavy tar, tarry material. Then when it gets to the receiving end at the refinery, they actually just run it through a hot chamber, boil off the naphtha, and pipeline it back to a much smaller diameter pipeline. And that's, that's just what's called dill bit. Then there's what's called sin bit, where they take a refined oil and mix it back with the crude oil in order to once again reduce the viscosity so that it can be put through a pipeline. And doesn't this stuff sink? It reacts differently in water? The, the original bitumen will sink in water. What happens with a dill bit, if you spill it, at first it's lighter than water until the naphtha evaporates off. And the biggest concern about a spill, like if you were in that town in, in Arkansas, is both breathing the fumes and the potential fire hazard from the naphtha, <laughs> not, not, the, not necessarily the heavy oil, but the, actually the diluent is the bigger half of the problem. And are they not still Sam cleaning up the, the, uh, the spill in uh, Michigan, Kalamazoo, Michigan? But I think some of that's still ongoing. Let's have our audience question. Welcome to Climate One. I have a question for all of you, including you, Greg. You mentioned that the State Department has prepared an environmental impact statement on the Keystone Pipeline. Has any of you read the Environmental Protection Agency's comments on this EIS? And if so, would you like to say a few words about that? I read the letter recently. I'm not sure I understood it. They said yeah. the State Department didn't do enough and that some of their assumptions were wrong, that the yeah. impacts could be greater. Uh, who else would like to tackle that? I agree. I mean I, I, I mean, I read a, a, a summary of it, and I agree. And I think they took a look at the argument that, hey, we're going to get it there one way or another, and this is not a valid argument. By the way, you know, you can justify anything bad if you just say, say that. So it's, it's, but, uh, but the EPA is really interesting to see that within our own government, there's different departments taking different stands on this. And there's been some very cozy relationships between some of the uh, contractors doing the work for the State Department, uh, who previously worked for TransCanada, the, the company building the pipeline. Uh, let's, let's have our next audience question. <laughs> I agree with the comment that the price of gasoline is about the same price of, of water. Uh, and I noticed a few years ago when the price of gasoline uh, was a little bit over $5, people started seriously considering getting rid of their SUVs, um, maybe better land use planning, walking more, riding bicycles, things like that. And then once the price of gasoline dropped below $4, it was all people just stopped talking about it. So I've thought for a long time, although I, I, I wouldn't tell my friends this, that I think gasoline should be $10 a gallon because that's the only way you're going to get people's attention uh, about you know, riding bicycles, having land use planning so you can walk to grocery stores, things like that. But you know, how likely is it that we're, we're going to get to $10 a gallon in this country or something near, near that? And even if we did, you know, the rest of the world could just say, fine, we're going to sell gas for 2 or $3 a gallon, and it really wouldn't help the overall uh, you know, carbon uh, levels. So, uh, Thank so you. I guess my, yeah, my question is, how likely is it we're going to get up to Well, it is, it is that. In, in Europe, it's already, you know, 8 I mean, it's getting close yeah, to $10 a gallon. And, uh, they, and they put out, uh, the average European, I think, puts out half the CO2 that the average American does. And they actually have a very nice lifestyle for all the jokes we make about it here. But, you know, the, uh, so it, it's true that that's a great way. And, and uh, carbon price is a way to address that, right? They, they actually just have gas taxes. They didn't do it for the carbon originally. But mm -hmm. a, a carbon tax would raise the price, make alternatives cheaper, 
we would use less, get higher efficiency cars. We wouldn't need the pipeline because we would save far more fuel than the pipeline delivers. But it'd take but a big carbon price to get you up to $10 a gallon. A lot that, bigger that than any of the yeah. carbon right. prices people but are talking about right now. And Cassie Doyle in Canada, gas prices are close to $10 a, a, a gallon. Uh, do people drive smaller cars? Does that, is that, how does that affect the, the uh, vehicle sector contribution to greenhouse gases? Well, our, our overall fleet is smaller. In, and more efficient in, in Canada than it is in the United States. We have uh, fewer cars per household and vehicle miles traveled. So I think it, it does make somewhat of a difference, but not, not, not as significant, I think, as, as these new cafe standards, I think will have a, a much more, more impact on, on vehicle efficiency. Let's have our next question. Welcome. Hi, this question might be for Dan or Sam. Um, if the Obama administration approves the pipeline, and expands the overall carbon fuel supply in the world. What impact might this have on the international climate negotiations and U.S. credibility, particularly <laughs> in an attempt to influence China's development? Because uh, they're the largest emitter, emitter now, and perhaps that's really substantial. Sam Avery, thought on that? I'm not certain how it will affect our national negotiating position on international agreements. I'm not certain about that. but I. <laughs> If I can take your question and turn it a little bit, I would like to say that if the administration approves this pipeline and it begins construction, there's going to be a lot of people negotiating from a very grassroots position on this. Namely, at this point, 59,000 people have signed a pledge to resist this pipeline through civil disobedience, if necessary. I am one of them. Many of us will be going to the root of this pipeline, and we will stand between the earth and the destruction of the earth. We will be civil. We will be peaceful. We do not mean to make TransCanada our enemy. We are not their enemy. They are not our enemy. We will be respectful of their employees and of their contractors. We will be respectful of the local people and the law enforcement people that we encounter, but we will be firm. You shall not pass. We, will, we are ready to lose this particular battle, but we will win the hearts and minds of humanity, and we will prevail. But back, back to the, the government's position, um, we don't really have any credibility because we don't have any policy in place to limit carbon. So how can we go to China and say, by the way, you really should cut back on your CO2 emissions because you know, it really looks really bad. They're going to say, what are, you what are you talking about? Most of the CO2, the majority of the CO2 in the air is red, white, and blue, even though China is now currently uh, putting more out than we do on a yearly basis. But remember, it lasts up there forever, so it's the total that matters. And so we have no credibility until we actually put a price on carbon. And then, by the way, if we just put a price on carbon, gave all the money back to citizens so everyone had money to pay for the higher fuel prices, and then put a border duty on, f on products coming from other countries that don't have their own price on carbon, we would immediately get most of the world to have a price on carbon. So that's the way we can take a situation where we have no credibility to, to a situation where we can actually have effective and almost immediate impact on the situation. Dan Miller is a clean tech investor. Let's have our next audience question in Climate One. Welcome. Yes, uh, you just said we will win the hearts and minds of people. And everyone knows that we need climate change. Uh, we need to help have uh, climate change for the better. And yet, Everyone seems to be using logic, and logic right. doesn't reach the reptilian part of our brain. Absolutely. So when you said, um, win the hearts and minds, uh, and then Dan said before something about it's a moral issue, um, what if you change your arguments? Because if you only have three years, you have to do this fast, and reach people in a huge way, like the cigarette campaign. Mm -hmm. um, with the moral issue. Um, I stopped smoking myself, but then you get people said, I don't have the right to harm you with my smoke. And if you try to do accomplish uh, the climate change that we need um, by a huge campaign of using mo the moral argument, I think you would reach people because there's something wrong with using perfectly good arguments and nobody changes. Right. You, you are you. not doing it the right way 
and what is the right way. Sam Avery, you write about a person in your book that wants to make burning fossil fuels the equivalent of, uh, or the pipeline of apartheid in South Africa. Mm -hmm. All right, well, I don't look at it that way myself, personally. I don't look at people who are producing and making fossil fuels available for us. They're not evil. They're producing what we demand. Mm -hmm. They're selling only what we buy. And so it's not a question of us versus them. This is not good guys and bad guys. We're all in the same boat here. And the big question we have to keep our, ourselves on here today and in general is do we extract yet more fossil fuel? Do we keep going in this direction? Do we invest billions and billions of dollars in infrastructure that will bring us more fossil fuel? Or do we invest billions of dollars in renewable energy, which will also produce jobs, which will also produce investment opportunities, which will also bring energy into our system. So it's a question of what kind of world are we going to start to build right now, one we can live in or one we're going to make an immediate profit from. Sam Avery is the author of The Pipeline and the Paradigm. Let's have our next question here at Climate One. And I'll make this a very fast question. If this uh, uh, tar sands in Alberta is so uh, huge and, and profitable. Aren't there other tar sand places they're going to be finding in the world? Think China? Uh, yeah, Greg Croft, you're the, you're the, the geology and petroleum expert yeah. here, Greg Croft. Uh, what you'll find, those are the two largest deposits in the world by far are in Canada and in eastern Venezuela. They are similar in size. I, you know, it depends on whose report you're going to look at. The next biggest area of heavy oil is at the, around the upper end of the Persian Gulf in southeastern Iraq, Kuwait, neutral zone, northernmost Saudi Arabia. That's about 200 billion barrels, so about one-sixth of the size of either the Canadian or the Venezuelan heavy oil deposits. <coughs> and of course, we haven't even talked about the Venezuelan heavy oil deposits here, but they are also going to be developed at some point in likelihood and use the same technology as Canada. We're talking about the oil sands and Keystone Pipeline. Let's have our next audience question. Um, my question is kind of about the economic influences of big business and corporations, since in America those uh, entities do play a really big role in getting things accomplished. What do you see the role of big business in this debate um, as far as political or economic influences they could have to swing this one way or the other? <laughs> then, who like Greg Croft? Well, you've got big business on both sides. You've got big oil producers in Canada that, that include subsidiaries of U.S. majors like Chevron, Shell, and Exxon, or Shell is a European major, but Chevron and Exxon, that are in favor of the pipeline. You also have U.S. industrial interests that benefit from the delay of the pipeline because of this differential in price we've talked about. <laughs> the cheapest oil in the world is in the upper U.S. Midwest, which is an area, a big center of, of heavy industry, so if you're going to build your oil-consuming factory in Chicago right now, you get oil cheaper than if you build it in the Jebel Ali free zone in Dubai. <laughs> your break, your, if you choose Dubai, the reason you'll do it is because Dubai has no income tax, but you'll be paying less for oil in Chicago <laughs> right now. So there are a bunch of industrial interests that benefit hugely from delaying the pipeline. And if we shift the oil onto rail, the, this will in particular benefit Burlington Northern Railroad and its single largest shareholder, <laughs> no Warren kidding. Buffett. So there's big industrial interests and very wealthy individuals on both sides of this argument. So Sam Avery, any of those industrial in interests uh, secretly funding the, uh, the activists trying to block the pipeline? <laughs> Well, I, I haven't got my check yet. <laughs> can, I, can I just add Cassie something? On, on the, 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 the large uh, energy producers who are, come from around the world that are, uh, that are active in the oil sands have certainly are, have formed a, a council to drive down the overall GHG uh, emissions associated with oil greenhouse sands. Greenhouse gas emissions. Yes, greenhouse gas emissions. So there is an oil sands innovation alliance. And that, it, so there certain, there certainly is a commitment and an understanding that to secure a social license for the export of that oil in North America that is going to require a, a, a much more efficient way of processing it. So I, I think we should, it, it, there is a fair amount of activity and investment in technologies now to, to produce that oil in the cleanest way possible. Because they realize all the, all the opposition they're facing. Okay. Let's have our next audience question. Welcome. I wanted to ask something about the United States national interest in this oil. Um, <clears throat> we are 
a net exporter of refined products of oil by about a million gallons a day. We have increased our, uh, our exports by a factor of three since 2006. We have been producing a lot more oil in this country. So your oil, that is to say the, the Keystone XL oil, will be exported. It will not be here like the Keystone One pipeline, which is refined in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So um, the uh, Alberta government expects to increase its production. This pipeline is 830,000 barrels per day to something between four and six million barrels a day. So we don't need this stuff. My question here is how many more pipelines do you expect to be approved by the United States government? And in general, where do you expect this oil to go and how will it get there? Cassie Doyle? Well, right now the, the United States is importing about half of its oil and it's consuming somewhere between 18 and 19 million barrels per day. So the, the, and the State Department's recent report indicated that the, the oil coming in from the Keystone XL would be to displace current oil that's coming in from Venezuela and Mexico and some domestic, and it's all heavy. It's heavy displacing heavy oil. So the, the assumptions that this is going to be exported, it, it, I think are unfounded. They certainly were not found in the State Department. Um, there, there is, this country still, even though there has been an increase in, in, in production of oil, is still importing relatively about half of the oil that's coming in. Much of it's coming in by tanker, uh, from from other from the Middle East and from uh, other countries in in the Americas, and that is not subject to any kind of environmental review. So, I, you know, one of the things that you always have to be mindful of is just what's the the playing field here. Though some people have said that there was some disclosure by the companies building the pipeline to their investors that the oil would be exported because it gets a higher price, as we've heard. The oil price mm -hmm. in the U.S. is lower than the, than the international price. Mm -hmm. Those companies naturally want to sell their oil to where they can get the. Uh, get the higher price, right? Let's, uh, uh, we got to wrap it up here. Let's have our last audience question. Yes, sir, welcome. Okay, I, I'd like to put a voice in for the electric car. I think it's the one thing that exists within our society today that is a, a solution for the world if, uh, in fact, uh, our population could uh, get convinced to do it and, uh, and use renewable energy in our uh, uh, electric plants. But, uh, I'm nevertheless a, a little bit depressed by the discussion today because uh, I'm, I suspect I'm older than all of you. Uh, and uh, in fact, the decisions will be made by people that are not going to be affected by the reality of what's going to happen with the CO2. Uh, and uh, it's two or three generations down that uh, may very well have their lives uh, ruined in an irreparable way. And this message, I don't think, gets across particularly well on the part. Of, certainly, economists don't uh, talk about it particularly well. And I think our politicians, they tend to have a memory that lasts for as long as their term exists. Mm -hmm. So that I think we have a serious problem. And I think it really is a moral problem. And I think we need more moral input in order to deal with it. We have to wrap it up quickly, but who'd like to tackle that? I mean. Dan, you've talked about uh, future That's generations. Not three generations. It's, this, it's the, our current children are going to be alive in 2030, 2050, 2060. Uh, this, this decade will be an exciting one. Uh, there's a Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. Well, now we live in interesting times. And so, uh, and by the way, I think there's some good news in that, in that we're, we're beginning to wake up. Hurricane Sandy helped us do it. The drought is, is helping us do it. There's going to be a lot of that happening this decade, and uh, people are now aware, it, you know, it's not like just, doesn't seem random anymore. So hopefully we'll actually take some steps, and there are some easy steps we can take right away that would have big impacts, help the economy, spur innovation and investment, and, uh, or we could just keep doing what we're doing, I guess. But there are a couple of Craig important Trump. precedents on, uh, on dealing with these long-term problems that I would point to. One is the global test ban on nucle atmospheric nuclear testing. That's an example of a very long-term problem. It was a serious global problem. We increased the background radiation in the entire world doing it. And there seems to be a fairly effective treaty that, you know, even people like North Korea, when they detonate a bomb, they do it underground now. 
So we, we have had an effect. Another one I would point to is the degradation of the ozone layer, the restrictions on chlor chlorofluorocarbon emissions. You know, that was a significant long-term problem, and there has been major steps taken to address it. We have to uh, end it there. We've been discussing the Keystone XL pipeline and oil from Canada here at Climate One. Our guests have been Sam Avery, author of The Pipeline and the Paradigm, Greg Croft, lecturer at St. Mary's College of California, Cassie Doyle, Consul General for Canada in San Francisco, and Dan Miller, Managing Director at the Rota Group and Investment Group. I'm Greg Dalton. Thank you all for coming to Climate One today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Glad you were here.